Hi everybody, welcome to this special CUBE presentation. My name is Dave Vellante and we're here on the ground in New York City at One Madison. This is the IBM Analyst Relations Forum. It's an annual huge event, a number of analysts here, you know, well over a hundred, getting deep dives on IBM, its strategy, a lot of AI talk, of course. And we're here with Sriram Raghavan, who's the Vice President of Research for AI at IBM Research. Sriram, thanks so much for coming on the program. Awesome, Dave, pleasure to be here and look forward to the conversation. Yeah, let's get into it. Let's start with your role. I mean, IBM Research is, it's an American icon um, and one that is, I think, experiencing a new renaissance. What's your role there? And, and tell us a little bit about how you spend your time. Awesome, so uh, my official role is I'm Vice President at IBM Research for AI. That means my responsibility is the strategy and execution of everything we do in core AI research, R&D, at IBM Research. I sit out of our labs here, just you know, half an hour north of where we are sitting today. And we have a global team of you know, thousands of research scientists and engineers who are building both foundational AI, applying it, delivering it to our clients and partners. I, in my role, partner with leaders of every part of IBM, IBM Consulting, IBM Software, Red Hat, IBM Infrastructure. And the goal is really to deliver state-of-the-art AI technology for the enterprise into every one of our products and offerings, whether it is hardware, whether it's software, whether it's consulting. So you're in Yorktown Heights at the Thomas J. Watson Research Absolutely. Facility, which is amazing. You might recall our audience last year, we did a little uh, a cube hit from there. It's a, it's a wonderful facility, great vibe. First of all, it's beautiful, but you feel smarter just walking in with all the brains. <laughs> That's my home, uh, yes. I, I want to talk about uh, AI adoption. So some of the data that we have from our survey uh, with our partner ETR shows that 74% of customers uh, have at least one use case for Gen AI into production, but these use cases, I call them chatty. Mm -hmm. You know, they're very chat GPT-like. Mm -hmm. um, I, I say the enterprises are largely hitting singles right now in terms of ROI. 40 to 50% of the customers tell us they're, they're stealing from other budgets to fund uh, their, their Gen AI. And so it's early days and they're pushing their ROI expectations out. In the early days it was, yeah, inside of three months, it'll be two weeks before we get right. ROI. Now it's sort of pushing out to a, a little a year or more. And that's a result of, I think, their initial testing and, and so forth. What are you seeing in sort of overall adoption? So I think we're definitely seeing the shift, as you said, from let's me try something cool with this technology to now really ROI conversations. And in the ROI conversation usually comes down to a few things, Dave. It comes down to what's the most efficient and effective way can I get to the outcome? As opposed to, let me just try the first way in which I get an outcome. What's the most efficient and effective way? Uh, and that goes back to what's the right model? What's the right architecture? Where do I run it? Second thing it gets to is for me to really get ROI, I need to be able to customize it. I can take something off the shelf, get started. How do I customize it for my needs? And the third thing then it gets to is, now tell me how I scale. Most enterprises have a complex business. I run, I have applications and data sitting in a number of places. In IBM parlance, we say, all enterprises we talk to have a hybrid estate. Some public cloud, some private cloud, some on-prem. How do you help me get my AI working in that hybrid environment? So it's really, cost and performance, right fit for purpose technology, ability to customize for that enterprise's needs, and then how do I scale this? And we're definitely seeing that inflection point. And that inflection point between experimentation and real value hits on these three vectors. You know, our data shows that it's probably around 92% of the world is hybrid. I know very few customers are exactly. 100% you know, in the cloud. Even us, a small company like ours, we do have some on-prem. Um, Let's talk about the new LLMs that you're releasing. Right. I think it's 3.0, granted uh, 2 billion and 8 billion parameter models. Before we get into the announcement, can you explain parameters? We throw this term around a lot. Right. And it talks to the, speaks to the weights and the biases. People see a bigger number, they, they infer, the, oh, that must be a better model. But of course, as you well know, cost is a huge implication. Exactly. So, but explain what parameters are for the layperson. So, parameters are a way to say, how does the model represent the data that you train it on? So you assume, therefore, that larger means I can do more. The reality is that, let's take this, the, the models we're going to be talking about. Those aren't consuming small amounts of data just because they are smaller than some of the other models you hear about. The models that we're releasing have 12 trillion tokens of data going into them. What's actually happened is, to some extent, over the last few years of continued innovation, 
we're all figuring out. We were out there saying that first and now the others are joining us. You can do a lot with 8, 10 billion parameters. It doesn't make them, those models, any less efficient or effective. Now, yes, if you come in and say, I have no idea what I want to do. I want to do a million different things. Sure, then you probably want a model that is doubled. But most enterprises are like that. They usually know, I want to improve my customer service. I want to be able to do Q&A self-service for my partners. I want to make my employee HR questions, you know, rapid turnaround, effective response without always waiting for those use cases, you can do a lot with eight to 10 billion parameters. So para think of parameters as in relating to model size, but people assume that necessarily means the model is less performant and it's not because it sees a lot of data. And why does model size become important? Goes back to our previous conversation, cost. If I need to put a, a fat model, I need larger hardware, it takes longer, every query will require more hardware, money, power, all of that. If I can get the same thing done with a model that is a tenth, hundredth size, you get the same outcome, but you get it for much cheaper. Yeah, so remember, of course, the, the, these large language models that we're all familiar with, like GPT-4, they're trained on everything. Okay, IBM's strategy is to really focus on enterprise value. So we often talk on theCUBE about small language models and domain-specific models. And, and, and from a cost standpoint, enterprises are going to be much more receptive to those models, and we're going to talk about what you're announcing. But in addition, instead of training on the internet where everybody has access to it, you're going to train on your specific data and it's going to bring proprietary advantage. So let's talk about what you're announcing yes. um, in, in 3.0. Awesome. So, so we went through, let me explain sort of the 3.0 generation. We're announcing Granite 3.0. Now, why 3.0? First version of Granite, we, we started really with sort of fit for purpose models for some of our applications and software. Earlier this year in Granite 2.0, we basically went open, started releasing models in the open, and we're continuing that with Granite 3.0. But the focus in that release was primarily around code models. We released a family of code mm -hmm. models. We had early versions of time series models. With Granite 3.0, we're releasing, and let me just run through everything we're releasing, and then we're going to have a discussion. Right. So we're releasing two flagship language models, Granite 8 billion, Granite 2 billion. They get released in both a base version and an instruct version. But, but the point is that they are like the workhorse models. They let you do everything enterprises want to do. I do RAG, I do summarization, I do classification, all of the normal fundamental building blocks of most enterprise use cases today. They have been trained on, as I said, over 12 trillion tokens. Uh, they cover both 12 languages, you know, English, French, Spanish, Japanese, 12 languages that we doubled down on in IBM, and over 116 programming languages. And, and they have state-of-the-art performance compared to all the models in the weight class, right? There's that weight class is the parameter size we're talking about. Associated with that, we're also releasing what we are called Granite Guardian models. Again, eight billion and two billion. What do the Guardian models do? They, in some respects, give you sort of this cloak of protection around the main model. So you have a model, you extend data and you get data out, but you always worry about what if the model has toxicity, has biased information, uh, somebody's trying to jailbreak the model and get it to do what I don't want it to do. So Granite Guardian models, you put, like I said, in front of the model and outside the model. So what's coming into the main model, what's going out the model, you put the Granite Guardian models. And they have best of breed performance respect to what's called guardrails. They have detectors for all of these things and we have benchmarked them, best of breed. So that's the second category. We're also releasing an accelerator model. The goal of the accelerator model, again, goes back to ROI. We are releasing the accelerator only for the 8B because the 2B model is already very small, very efficient. The 8B model, suppose you want to get even more throughput on a given piece of hardware, you attach the accelerator model, you get two, two and a half times throughput and latency on a given piece of hardware because the little accelerator model finds a way to sort of do guess what the big model is going to do and let it do faster. It's a technique called speculative decoding. That's the third. And then last piece of Granite 3.0, is we are releasing a first set of mixture of experts model from IBM using a new mixture of experts architecture. And we have intentionally focused that initially on the really, really small. So what's unique with this mixture of experts model is, I'm going to use the word and then I'll explain the word. We have a 3BA800 million. What does it mean? It means the model behaves trained as if it's a 3 billion parameter model, but at inference time, it only requires the cost of 800 million parameters. And we're releasing two models, both of which are going to use less than a billion parameters at inference time. And the, really the goal there is to target 
a developer getting started. I have a little laptop. I want to experiment with Granite. Edge devices where you don't have the ability to run even an 8 billion parameter model. That's the mixture of experts model. So 2B, 8B, Guardian models, accelerator, mixture of experts models. That's the new Granite 3 Dota family that we're bringing up. So just for context, GPT-3 I think is probably 175 billion parameters. So we're talking about 2 billion and 8 billion. Uh, significantly less expensive and any CFO will tell you the best way to get ROI is to reduce the denominator, <laughs> right? lower the price, That's right. lower the cost. Um, now you showed benchmarks in our session earlier today relative to GPT-4, uh, Llama, all the major models in Granite um, showed uh, very well leading in all those categories. And they are a combination of industry standard benchmarks and you also have added some of your own benchmarks like in cybersecurity. Right. So, and some very impressive numbers in terms of performance. What about accuracy? How do you compare from an accuracy standpoint to some of these other large? So all of the benchmarks is actually accuracy benchmarks. Mm -hmm. They were actually accuracy benchmarks and we did two kinds of comparisons. This was model on its own, vanilla, compared on both academic and proprietary benchmarks with other models in the same category, right? It's apples to apples. Models from other open source providers, you know, Google and, and Meta and others. To just give you a sense of, okay, this is the performance you can get, best of breed for models in that category. Then the other comparison you saw is, if I know what I'm doing, an enterprise use case, so I am trying to answer Q&A on reconciliation procedures inside a bank. I'm trying to do classification of customer complaints, a telecom company. Uh, or I'm inside IBM and I'm, 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 I'm trying to automate my code to cash process. Those examples, what you saw were the granite models, with the other technology we released earlier, this called InstraClab, that lets you customize for that use case, essentially saying, look, I can match or exceed the performance of a GPT model, but now I am 75 to 95% cheaper. Okay, so, so that's a combo. So you pin on the accuracy and then measure the performance from that, that's, that exactly. anchored point. Exactly. Uh, that's, that's a very Because it's not useful nuance. to say I am cheaper, but hey, my results are going to not be good enough, right? Yeah, so that's I, I think that's a huge difference. I mean, my next question was going to be, how do you differentiate? Well, that's, it's sort of an obvious throwaway question here, but I, I'd like to understand if just in your words, how you see the competitive differentiation of IBM relative to some of these other offerings. Of course, you're open source and you're Apache 2.0. I've talked to customers who have said, we don't want to use I'll just use an example, sorry Meta, not to pick on Llama because you're doing some awesome work, but we don't want to use Llama because it says, well, at some point they can come back and, and, and charge us. Uh, you're Apache 2.0, full open source, I have no constraints. So that's one differentiator. What are some of the other differentiators in the market? I would list it in the following way. So number one, I think, is the choice of the data that we want to put in. Like we, the, the benchmarks that we picked, that 12 trillion tokens was carefully curated enterprise relevant data. And we understand as IBM, I think, the, the ambit we have through our consulting and software business and enterprise, we understand right. what use cases matter. So a focus on enterprise relevant data went into the model. Second, you said, open Apache license so that everybody understands exactly what you're getting with a model, which means you have starting with a base to customize that everybody understands. We've been dealing with Apache license for a long time, the world understands. I think the third differentiator I would say is, we are optimizing and making this model available in a hybrid environment. So obviously the model will be available on Watson X and Watson X runs in a hybrid environment. So that's right out of the back. Later this year, the models will be available through both RHEL AI and OpenShift AI. So which means whether you're running on-prem or on the cloud, the IBM cloud, partner clouds, you're going to have this model optimized in a platform that runs everywhere. And we're also making the model available obviously open source on Hugging Face, download, developers use it with whatever tools you're familiar with. The model is also available on Olama, which is a very popular place for developers to pick it up. So I think that hybrid angle, and by the way, the model is also available through NIMStack with NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. So enterprise focus, what we talked about performance and cost, Apache license, a hybrid environment availability, and then last, and I have to say this, the backing of IBM with respect to the trust, governance, and for clients, the indemnification that we provide as they start to use Granite in a commercial context. I think that's a foundational differentiation that sort of completes the story. So very us. open mindset with a differentiated, I would say highly differentiated uh, model approach. 
incorporated in with, whether it's IBM Consulting, I'm sure you're going to be embedding into IBM software across the portfolio, specificity for the customer, those domain specific models. So I want to come back to use cases. As, you, as models like this come to market, right. and we have, we published, you know, a couple of years ago, actually, the, we call it the power law of Gen AI, where you have along various industries domain specificity with mm -hmm. smaller mm -hmm. language models, and that mm -hmm. seems to be playing out here, you know, specifically. So as you roll this out, what kind of use cases are you seeing beyond what we were talking about before, the chatty use cases, text summarization, you know, code generation, all wonderful things, right. but not the big NPVs that customers and CFOs are after. How are you seeing, or how do you expect the use cases to evolve as a result of this? So I think I, think I look at it in three buckets, uh, Dave. There are three big buckets of use cases. The first bucket is customer care writ large. They can start with, as you call, the chatty thingies, mm -hmm. but customer care writ large, and, and when I use the word customer, sometimes it is true and customer facing. Sometimes the customer is the internal employee. Sometimes the customer is a partner portal, a supplier portal. So where you are essentially connecting to to other human beings through a business process and lots of data and questions. I think customer care in this broader definition is a huge area that we are seeing. We're seeing, in fact, a spectrum from our, from our existing Watson X assistant business, which by the way already embeds Granite, to new capabilities opened up by the new generation of models. The second category is broadly enterprise automation. We call it digital labor. And you heard yesterday with consulting, the embedding of Granite into consulting advantage is going to open up Consulting is talking about millions of digital assistants that are going to partner with the human beings in IBM Consulting to drive process transformation. We have done some internal benchmarking of this latest generation of Granite models we talked about with carefully curated BPO benchmarks, right? Consulting does BPO across the world. These are unique proprietary benchmarks that you're not going to get reflected in the academic domain. The Granite models, because of the value we put into the data that went into the models, are doing phenomenally well with models that are the big ones, double, triple the size. Now that allows consulting to go in and offer a differentiated value proposition with the domain knowledge of running a BPO process. Now, with the absolute cheapest cost model that you can do, that's going to transform the BPO process. And then the third category, so sort of customer care, digital labor, business automation, including you know, things like BPO, and the third category is everything to do with code. And code comes in a few flavors. We went out initially with our Watson Code Assistant family of products, all powered on Granite models. And we targeted first our COBOL franchise, the COBOL to Java modernization. Uh, we are now releasing WCA Code Assistant for, powered by Granite for general purpose programming, specifically around Java, which again, is a language we understand very well in IBM, mm -hmm. our footprint with WebSphere and the decades of having enterprise Java. And it's ubiquitous. Yeah. It's ubiquitous. Yeah. So, so that's the second big, and that's the spectrum of use cases. It sometimes starts with helper developer, but I'll tell you it's amazing. You know what's the most important use case we hear in code? Code explanation. Forget about even helping. Ah, what does this say? Yes, because I'm <laughs> dealing with legacy code. Yeah. Every enterprise is dealing with lots of code. I have my new batch of developers. Can you help them mm. understand what the code is doing? It's amazing how much value that gives. So we're very excited about these three big categories. And we see Granite already embedded in every one of the IBM software products, and that's going to keep going. I saw, we saw some, um, I think Rob Thomas and Dario presented some um, information on productivity gains. Right. On specific, you said one, one was like off the charts, it, by the way, on cost. It, one, uh, I think it was a telco, 6.6 .6 .6 million annual cost for traditional, using traditional LLMs versus $420,000 right. right. annually. With, I mean, that's just n night and day. With some pretty sub substantive productivity improvements. I want to push you a little bit on this. Or it, maybe you can answer this, maybe you can't, maybe you don't have enough visibility yet, but compared to RPA, right. okay, which is very deterministic, I've got a process, it's hard-coded, it works, it's maybe a little bit of a heavy lift to get started, uh, but it's delivered some pretty good productivity improvements. Are you seeing any patterns in terms of those companies who have installed RPA, they have that plumbing and maybe bringing things like Granite on top of that, and or folks that have not implemented that kind of enterprise automation and are starting from maybe from a blank sheet of paper mm -hmm. and the kind of productivity. So is there a productivity boost above and beyond RPA? Or is it more you can do things that RPA can't do? Um, and is there any 
sort of patterns that you can discern there? Because it's a really important question for a lot of customers in the marketplace. Do I throw out my RPA or do I build on top of it? I think, I think, I think the answer is that there's going to be benefit in all of these scenarios. Because mm -hmm. let me put it this way. Certainly, you're starting with a clean sheet of paper. This is the technology arc you want to run on. Why go back, right? So that's, that's obvious. Even if you look at what RPA did, RPA was one of those things about take a particular step that a human being is doing and try to either help them do that faster or do it on their behalf. There wasn't an approach there where you can take an entire process and rethink how you do it. And I think that's what these models provide. So there's a difference between, and this is sort of the fundamental difference between, if you will, the previous generation of AI and this generation of AI, not to use too much of the word generation. The previous generation said, I'm going to take something very specific, build a model for that. Take something specific, build a model for that. And if I use the mo word model generously, RPA, you could imagine, had models in it. Maybe sure. sometimes they were rule-driven, they were sometimes. But the problem you ran into was, if a process had 50 steps, you were talking about building and maintaining 50 models. Now you're talking about a general purpose model, Granite, tune it with your process data, with InstructLab, you have that model, that model, the ability for it to do all of those 50 steps. With a single model, one stack, run it once, the, you're going to have an ROI difference that's like nothing we have seen. So, so I think the way to think about it is clean state, absolutely. If you've done RPA, you still have an opportunity now to start to replace it with a new generation of technology. You may still want to carry some of the plumbing and fabric, but I think that's a journey that's going to absolutely happen. This is too big a technology shift in the way we do AI for it not to change it fundamentally. I mean, we, I, we agree on this. Uh, I mean, I tend to be, I've seen a lot of waves. Saw the PC wave, you know, saw the internet wave, right. the cloud wave. This feels like it's bigger than all of those, and I, and I think it is. Although, of the hundreds of people that I've interviewed over the last two years, there was only one, literally one, that said, nah, I don't believe it. You know, and you're hearing a lot of noise in the media, things are overhyped. Um, <laughs> what gives you confidence that we're, we're right about this? So I think uh, two things. So one is first, internal experience at IBM. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, and I think you heard that from Rob earlier today. You did, yeah. uh, This is one of those eras where better than any other time in IBM, we have started, we have used this technology often early versions inside even before we put it up. That's confidence. IBM complex enterprise, we have a large number of employees, we run in a number of countries. If we can transform our code to cash, our ask HR, our the way we run uh, our BPO, I think these are, this really gives us confidence that the technology hunts here. That's number one. I think the second thing is that this inflection point is a real inflection point because the previous generation of AI hit two major um, sort of, how would you say, impediments in enterprise AI. The first impediment was, I need to build too many models. It's just too much expensive. And then to build each one of these models, you are going to ask me a lot of training data, label data, each one of them. This technology, so even in the previous generation, there were use cases, there was value, the technology wasn't ready. This now feels like, okay, you know what, this technology addresses exactly the two things we saw hitting us. That's an extra level of confidence. This isn't confidence coming from just the last two years. It's confidence coming from having seen these use cases, but now having the technology that actually addresses stuff that didn't let us scale in the previous generation. So between internal deployments and the fact that this technology is addressing real pain points, huge confidence. And I'll put it this way. I think we hear two kinds of narratives. We hear ah, hype, or we hear it's going to take over the world. The reality is, it's right in the middle. It's amazingly useful. It ain't taking over the world. But if you're done right, you're going to get enormous productivity like we have never seen before. Mm. Sri Ram, it's exciting to have you on. I hope we can have you back on theCUBE and, uh, and, and monitor the progress and pick your brain some more. I got so many more questions, but we're out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dave, Appreciate pleasure. Your time. And thank you for watching. Keep it right there. We're on the ground here at IBM in the Big Apple. Dave Vellante, John Furrier, and David Linticum. We're right back for this short break. <laughs>